Hello, everyone. This is the lecture for section 1.2 to 1.4, the definite integral, the fundamental theorems of calculus, and the integration formulas. So in this section, we're going to sort of pick it up a little bit. Um, we're going to cover a, fun, a, a bunch of stuff uh, here in this section, just to hurry up the process. We're getting through uh, um, a lot of stuff here, uh, just so that we can start getting into the sort of the newer stuff in calculus. And, what you're supposed to be getting to in Calc 2, okay? Um, in particular, uh, doing the definite integral, uh, the fundamental theorems of calculus, of which uh, if we don't have them, we won't, we wouldn't know how to, um, uh, we wouldn't have to know how to integrate anything, um, and uh, specific integration formulas that we'll be using throughout the semester, okay? Um, these integration formulas, you should have picked them up uh, last semester if your instructor got to them. If not, this is going to be the one section I'm going to do it. And then from here on out, we're just going to use them like a lot, a lot, a lot. OK, so um, this section, at least this lecture is going to be a mishmash. There's going to be certain things that are out of order here and there, but not too much. Uh, but most of this stuff, I mean, it's required. It's you need this to move on. OK, uh, so the first thing I'm going to get to. Is a, a collection of. Uh, integrals, sort of common integrals that uh, you guys should know, okay, that you guys should pick up, whether it, it was from last semester or just now, right now, this is the first time you see them, this is going to be the common ones that we're going to see, okay, uh, the integral of any uh, k value, so k can be 5, it can be 12, it can be anything like that, uh, the integral of a value k is just kx plus c, uh, the integral of 1 over x, dx is going to be ln, um, let me actually go to this one first. This one's a very common one that we're going to use, okay? The uh, integral of x to the n dx, okay? Uh, whenever you have x to some power, the integral or the antiderivative for it is going to be x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, okay? Um, and I'll show you guys how to do that when we get there, okay? Um, in the example, uh, when you take the integral of cosine, it is a uh, sine. And when you take the integral of sine, it is cosine. Uh, something that I usually teach in my Calc 1 class is this little loop right here. I do sine and cosine, right? And then, and then it's going to be an x. I have this thing that goes this way like this, right? Plus and minus. So if you take the derivative you take the derivative, notice what I'm saying. If you take the derivative of sine, it's just positive cosine, right? And if you take the derivative of cosine, it should be negative sine, right? So it follows whatever signs those are, and that's for the derivative, right? So the same thing works in the opposite direction. So if we go, if you have sine, right, then the integral of sine, let me change this back to a negative there. There we go. If you have sine, then the integral of sine is negative cosine, which is exactly what we have here, right? And then the same thing, if you have cosine, the integral of cosine is positive sine, which is what we have here. Okay, same rules work, right? The same little trick, the same little cycle thing that we have there uh, still works here. OK, it's just you're going in the opposite direction. Um, one common one, and we'll pick up some more for trig as we move about. Um, the integral for secant squared is tangent. So if you remember, the derivative for tangent was secant squared. So if we go backwards, it should work out, right? Uh, the integral of e to the x is itself. You remember when the derivative of e to the x was itself, so is the integral, OK? <clears throat> and then last, the integral of b to the x. So this is this b value can be whatever it wants. Okay, uh, the integral of b to the x is just b to the x ln of b plus c. Okay, so now what I want to do is just go ahead and show you guys how to do some of these. Just how do these actually work? Okay, so we'll start off with this thing right here. Okay, just find the indefinite integral, okay? Um, for this one, I'm making it 
semi-simple so that you guys can sort of remember uh, the algebra that went into it and uh, some of the uh, uh, some of your pre-calc, some of the reduction, some of the rewrites that you can do uh, in order to compute these integrals, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that this is gonna be equivalent to the integral. I'm gonna change that square root of x to x to the one half times x squared plus three x plus one. Any rewrite is legit for all of this, right? Um, minus two sine of x. I'm gonna do this big, huge box brackets around it and then do dx at the end there, okay? This is equivalent to the integral. So if we take a look at just this little strip right here, okay, um, I can multiply that out, right? So one half times x squared, if you do your math right, that should be x to the five halves. One half times three uh, x, that's gonna be plus three x to the three halves. Okay, uh, and then plus x to the one half times one, that's just gonna be x to the one half minus two sine x. And I'm gonna put the big bracket again at the end, big bracket here at the end here, dx. Okay, now uh, we're gonna cover this a little bit later, right? Um, when you have an integral like this, a big, huge, long one with a bunch of pluses and minuses in between, you can break them apart into separate, smaller, little integrals. So uh, this is also equivalent to the integral of x to the 5 halves dx uh, plus, when you have a constant up front like that, 3 integral x to the 3 halves dx. Uh, plus the integral of x to the one half dx. And then I'm going to do the same thing here, minus two times the integral of sine of x dx. Okay. So at this point now, we get to use some of our shortcuts that we have up above, which I'll, um, I'll scroll up to right now. Uh, this one. It doesn't matter if the exponent is a fraction, the plus one rule still works. So this is gonna be x to the seven halves over seven halves plus three, the multiplier up, up front, the constant up front just comes along for the ride. Uh, x to the three halves plus one. So it's gonna be x to the five halves over five halves plus, x to the 1 half, that's going to be x to the 3 halves over 3 halves, minus 2. Now we get to use our integral for sine of x, which is right here. So it's going to be uh, negative cosine. So I'm going to turn that into a positive. So positive cosine of x plus c. And we are done. That is, this is our integral right here, OK? So uh, I'll leave this up to you guys to do. Um, but if you grab this and take the derivative, you should get this back. You should get that back. So I'll leave that uh, for you guys to try out. Uh, you could take my word for it or verify it yourself. OK. Uh, what comes up here now is a quick check. So again, just do the ones that's assigned to you. Uh, use all the tricks that you know from back in, uh, from Calc 1, okay? Uh, all of these are going to require you to break stuff up, rewrite, uh, and then use your integral rules, okay? So that one's going to be the evens. That one's going to be for the odds, okay? Uh, so now what I want to do is continue on our development for the integral itself, get our base theory down, okay? Uh, something I want to warn you guys about Um is this right here. Uh, let me put it in a, in a nice, brighter, flamboyant color if my, there we go. Uh, this right here, that dx, okay? Um, uh, 
if you guys remember when you guys were in calc one right we had something that was like this dy dx right or dy dt let me put dy over dx here <clears throat> right and depending on what you saw you took the derivative with respect to that variable. So you took the derivative with respect to x. You took the derivative with respect to t, correct? Right? So same thing happens when you take an integral, OK? Uh, when you take an integral, you have to take it with respect to some value. Every other variable that's there would be considered a constant value, OK? So it becomes very important for you to denote when you're taking an integral, you are taking it with respect to a specific value, which means that when you do this, uh, when you do the calculus for all of this, right, when you do the integral for all of this, you denote what variable you are taking the uh, integral by, okay? AKA, put your dx, put your dy, put your dz, okay? This will become very important in chapter two when we're gonna be actually integrating based off of dy's. We're gonna be integrating based off of the y values, not the x values, okay? And you don't wanna confuse yourself when you're trying to do these, okay? Okay, so now let's finish up with the definition, the, the good old sort of, the useful, the utmost highest echelon of the definition for an integral. And it's that, this one right here, okay? that the integral of a function a to b, okay, of a function f of x dx is equal to that limit of the sum. So if you guys remember how this went, right, I'm gonna go ahead and draw my x and my y again. And that's not what I wanted. Delete that. It's my x-axis, and this is going to be my y-axis right here. Not the best one. There we go. All right. So we have our x and our y here, right? And I'm just going to go ahead and draw a nice funky f right here, f of x. And I want the integral, right, from a to a value b, right? So the integral is defined as the area under my curve. So it's all of this. Whoa, my hand slipped there. The integral is all of this, all of it. This all right here is defined as my integral. So this a to b of f of x dx. And the way that we constructed it, right, if you guys remember, is we got to split up our uh, a, b interval into smaller little sub uh, intervals. And they were based off of some i value, right? So this one's going to be x, i minus 1, x, i. And then there was a nice rando x, i star somewhere in there. Remember, uh, the height of my little box, right? And that's what I really needed to define, right? And that could be determined by any point within my interval, right? So that's exactly what's happening here. I'm gonna go up to that point right there. That is how high this box has to go, right? Since we're doing this under a regular partition, right? the width of each one of these boxes was a delta x, which was defined by b minus a, b minus a over n, right? And the idea here, what, right, was that these boxes were going to get infinitely skinnier, skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. The way that we did that mathematically was that we added this limit, this limit as n goes to infinity. Essentially, what we're doing there is we are saying that uh, we are dividing up our A to B interval, right, into infinitely many smaller subintervals. So the number of subintervals was going toward infinity, right? And when that happened, the width, the dx, was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? AKA this thing was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, 
Okay, and as you let that go into uh, go off to infinity, the uh, approximation for the area under the curve that got better and better and better up until we got this bad boy up here, the actual integral. Okay, so that was the construction for the integral. That's how we found areas under the curve. Okay, so now uh, let me move on to a couple of fundamental, the, the two fundamental theorems of calculus. It's the two theorems that will allow us to do everything we need to, uh, not only math, but physics, chemistry, uh, engineering, um, you know, all that stuff. Okay, uh, the first one. The, fundament, the fundamental theorem of calculus number one, the first part, right, is that it solidifies the, if you guys remember, um, that the derivative and the antiderivative, or the integral, uh, they were inverse properties of each other, right? So if you had an integral and you wanted to undo it, you took the derivative, right? And vice versa, if you had the derivatives and uh, you took the integral, right? You undid it, right? So essentially, the uh, the derivative and the integral sort of undo each other. They're sort of inverse properties, okay? So that's what uh, fundamental theorem of calculus number one takes care of, okay? Fundamental num theorem number two of calculus, right, is what's commonly called the evaluation theorem, okay? This is the one that allows us to evaluate or get answers or get actual numbers for the area under a curve, okay? And this one goes as such. So if f of x is a continuous function and big F of x is any antiderivative of little f of x, right? Then the integral from a to b can be computed in this way. It'd be big F of b minus big F of a, okay? By construction of how we have our, um, by construction of how we have uh, uh, the integral defined, right? We get a couple pretty uh, pretty useful properties. Okay, <laughs> the first one, the first one. Suppose you go uh, from a to a. Okay, so let's go back up to our picture. Right. Suppose that you don't move from this location right here and you try to take the integral of it. There is no area there. So the area there, the integral would be zero. OK. Uh, the next one. Suppose you had the integral from A to B of a function f of x. If you swapped the limits of integration, if you guys see the A and the B in the second one, those are flipped. If you do that, then uh, you stick a negative in front, okay? So the best way to think about this is uh, the integral from A to B, that's moving forward, right? Uh, the integral from B to A, you're moving backward on your interval, right? And because of that, the values are gonna be negative. You want it to be positive because that's what the original one was. So you stick a negative up front, okay? The next one, we already used this one already. Suppose you have an f of x plus or minus a g of x, right? And you want to take the integral of either the addition or the difference of f and g, right? Then it's equivalent for you to split up each one separately, right? And then do the addition or the difference, whichever one you were doing to begin with, OK? Uh, the next one. Suppose you had uh, the integral uh, from A to B of C times some function dx, OK? So you're basically grabbing a function and then multiplying it by a constant value. And you're trying to take the integral of it from A to B, right? Then we also just used this not too long ago. That C value got to pop out of the integral, OK, if you guys see that. so. This is a good old, in a good old fashioned integral right there, right? And it's the C that's outside now. So you can evaluate uh, the integral from A to B of f of x 
get that thing and then multiply it by C. That's equivalent to having the C inside, okay? And then lastly, it's this one, okay? Suppose you had the integral from A to B of F of X. So this one concerns more of the interval over what, uh, over the inter the interval over which you will be doing the integral, okay? Uh, so you're doing this integral from A to B. If you choose any random point C, it doesn't have to be inside of A, B, okay? It makes most sense when the C value is between A and B, okay? But it really doesn't matter where that C value is. If you take the integral from A to C, and then again from C to B, it is equivalent to the original integral you started out with, this one right here. So basically saying you could take the integral from A to whatever point, right? And then from that whatever point back to your tail end to the end point B, right? And you still took the same integral from A to B. That simple, okay? Okay. Uh, something else that was uh, of concern back in Calc 1 when you guys uh, probably ran through this the first time uh, is because of the definition of because of how the integral was uh, constructed, right, we now might have negative areas, okay? And this produced two different definitions for what area we can get, okay? The first one was the net signed area. And the second one was what's called the total area, okay? So what I'm going to do, again, I'm going to put down a, uh, don't you hate when that happens? Come on, okay. Be nice to me. There we go, okay. So I'm going to plot down an x-axis and a y-axis, okay? And I'm going to put down uh, a function here, okay? Not anyone in particular, but just to sort of uh, show you guys what I'm talking about, okay? Here's my function f of x, right? And I'm going to do the same thing on the other end, the other square. Okay? And pretend, again that both of these are the same function. I know I can't draw them perfectly the same. Oh, that's pretty close. Okay. So as we defined an integral being the area under the curve, we have this going on. This is an area right here, right? And this is another area down here. Okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call this one A1 I'm going to call this one A2, okay? So now, to define the idea behind the net signed area and total area, because of how we constructed the integral, A1, since it's above the x-axis, right, uh, that one, that area is going to be positive, okay? And the sort of the double-edged sword, because of how we defined the integral, the area for A2, this area right here, is going to be negative. Okay, so then we have this thing going on. We have this going on. That the total area, the integral, from a value A over here, let's call that A, to B, is going to be the total area A1, whatever that is, okay? And in this case, we know it's positive. And we're gonna take away area A2 because we know it's gonna be negative. So it's gonna take, it, it's gonna take away area from A1, okay? Now let's move to the total area. So same idea, right? This right here is an area, and then this right here is the other end little bit of the area, right? And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to call this A1, and this I'm going to call A2. <coughs> okay? 
because of how we constructed the, uh, the integral, we know that this area is going to be positive because it's above the x-axis. It's got to be positive, right? But suppose we wanted the total area, right? We know this area right here, A2, is going to be negative, right? So we got to make it positive because we need the total area. We need both areas put together. We sh we're basically taking care of the fact that it's negative. So then we're going to consider this to be a positive area, OK? And that's where we get this thing. OK? So as an example, I've got a, a, a QR code there again. Uh, I've prepared a Desmos calculator for you to use, okay? Um, use it uh, to double check your work, okay? Uh, a lot of times, maybe sometimes uh, you just fumble on negative. That'd be a horrible way to, you know, be wrong for something like this, okay? Um, just go ahead and double check your answers. Uh, use it as freely as you need to. You use it on the homework that you have at home uh, online as well, okay? And for the lecture questions, I'm not going to really, uh, don't think that, you know, using the, the, the calculator is, uh, you know, shortcutting the work that you need to do. I'm much more concerned that you have the theory down rather than the computation, okay? Okay, so let's try to find the area under this curve, okay, from negative one to one. So uh, I need this area, right? I need all of this. I need this. And this. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand f of x. So f of x we know that that is x, x minus 1, x plus 1. And if you expand this out appropriately, you should get x cubed minus x, which means if I want to find the area under the curve, that is going to be the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x cubed minus x, and I'm going to put big brackets on it, dx. OK, so now I want to go ahead and uh, do both the net signed area and the total area so you guys can see what's supposed to be going on. OK, so the first one, net signed area. OK, when we do this, so that's going to be the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x cubed minus x dx. I'm going to go ahead and find the antiderivative of this, right? So that's uh, our trusty rule that, uh, you know, you add one to the exponent and divide by that exponent. So it's going to be x to the fourth over four minus x squared over two evaluated from negative one to one. Okay. We're going to go ahead and plug this in, right? So the first one goes first, the top one goes first. So it's going to be f of uh, one minus f of negative one. So it's going to be f of 1, that's going to be 1 quarter minus 1 half minus, I'm going to do it again, 1 quarter minus 1 half. Double check your math, OK? Double check how you're plugging this in, OK? And it turns out that's equal to 0, which makes sense. If you take a look at it, right, this area right here, is something, that area right there is that same something, but negative, right? So they should cancel each other out. Excuse me, right? So then this integral that we just found, that's zero. So everything is right with the world, right? So now let's go ahead and find the total area. So now I'm going to do TA for total area. I need to do the integral from negative 1 to 1, right, of x cubed minus x, all that, dx, OK? So what I have to do now, right, this area right here, this one, 
that one's golden because it's already positive, right? It's this one that's going to give us the trouble, right? We have to grab that one and then turn it positive since we want the total area. So I am going to go ahead and do the integral from negative 1 to 0 because that's going to be the positive amount, right, of x cubed minus x dx. And then I'm going to do the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed minus x dx, OK? Both of these are going to be evaluated the same way, right? So this is going to be x cubed minus x, uh, whoops, sorry, antiderivative, x to the fourth over 4 minus x squared over 2, evaluated from negative 1 to 0. And then this one is going to be the same thing, x to the fourth over 4 minus x squared over 2, evaluated from 0 to 1. Okay, If you end up doing this side, you're going to get 0 minus 1 fourth minus 1 half. And if you do this right, you should get 1 fourth. <laughs> and remember how I said this one should make sense, because 1 fourth is positive. That area right there is positive. All is right with the world, right? So we'll move on to this one. And if you do this one, you're going to get 1 fourth minus 1 half. Ooh. 1 fourth minus 1 half minus 0. And if you do this one right, this one should be negative 1 fourth. This one makes sense just as it stands because our area, remember, it was supposed to be negative, right? But since we're doing the total area, we don't want the negative area. We need the positive area. So we need to grab that one fourth and just turn it positive. That'll give us the portion that we need for our total area. So our total area, right, is going to be the one fourth from here plus another one fourth for that negative section that we have, right? So the total area is going to be one half. And that is going to be our final answer for the total area. We do that for the net signed area. OK, so now, how do you use the QR code? If you hold up your phone again to the QR code, it should scan it and it should redirect your phone automatically uh, to the Desmos calculator. I've got it right here. OK, uh, let me, there we go. Okay, so how do you use this? Uh, it's essentially, you can grab the dots and move them around, right? Or you can automatically just drag this or this or enter in your A and your B and it should calculate it for you. It only goes from negative 10 to 10 uh, for A and B, but that's no biggie. Uh, and it gives you the answer right here. It gives you the answer. It gives you the, the area. OK, the only thing that's missing is that you need to change your equation. So I'm going to change the f of x to x, x minus 1, x plus 1. And we have our function, right? Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to actually pull out. There we go. There we go. OK. And I wanted it from negative 1 to 1. So my a should be negative 1. So I'm going to grab this and drag it over to negative 1. And I'm going to grab my B and drag that over to positive 1. And if you take a look, my areas are 0, which makes sense. Remember how that made sense when we computed it just now? Let me zoom in a little bit more. There we go. OK, so the area total net, no, sorry, net signed area, right, is 0. This area canceled out this area. OK, now to figure out the uh, total area, right, we can grab our B and drag it back to zero. That's 0.25. So the area here is 0.25, which is a quarter, one fourth. And I'm going to grab the B and go to negative or positive one. I'm going to grab this one and drag it over to zero. There we go. That area is negative a quarter, negative 0.25. OK, and remember how I just said, right, 
we needed the positive area for this for the total area. So we grabbed that, gave it a positive instead, and added them, added them both together. Okay, so that's how you uh, use the definite integral calculator. Use it as much as you can. Double check your work as much as you can, okay? So after this example, there's a couple quick checks that I want you guys to do. Uh, like I said, only do the one that's assigned to you. Uh, confer with your group. Make sure you all have the same answer, okay? And I'm going to grab one from your group. I'm going to grab a version from your group, and I'm going to use it in the notes, okay? And I believe that is it. Lecture questions. I got a couple problems for you guys to practice. Um, go ahead, practice as much as you can, okay? Uh, I will double check these uh, probably about a week or so. Okay, if you have any questions about any of these questions, um, uh, you can go ahead, stop by the uh, Math Tutoring Center. I'm there. Uh, check the uh, my weekly uh, semester schedule to make sure where I'm at and if I'm going to be there. And as always, I have those um, uh, where I'm going to be online every day um, on Fridays for you guys to ask questions, just you guys, okay? Uh, besides that, uh, I'm done here. Happy studying.